Shaykhana, we will get directly to the point. Everybody is very interested in Islamic finance, but I'm going to ask a very technical question. My first question to you, Shaykhana, can you please define what is from our perspective riba and why is riba so problematic? So what is the technical definition of riba and why is riba so problematic according to our sharia? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah ya rabbil alameen. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم نور قلوبنا بالعلم وزين أخلاقنا بالحلم وافتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت خير الفاتحين كما ما بعد When it comes to riba, we have different categories of riba If you go to any classical fiqh book you read about riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa and riba al-nasiya and riba al-ta'am and riba al-nuqood to be honest with you, it, it, it's very confusing for the regular common mm -hmm. reader because the vast majority of those definitions and practical examples captured in those fiqh books do not exist nowadays. Mm -hmm. You read, for example, uh, exchanging wheat for barley or date fruit for date fruit. Right? Those examples are absolutely correct, but they are very, very irrelevant to our society. Mm -hmm. And this is actually where the confusion is coming from for an average Muslim American who lives in this society wants to like, you know, conduct transactions according to the Sharia without you know, being involved in riba. Let me just answer the question. The riba that, that we are referring to in the American society is the most severe level of riba, which is something prohibited according to all madhahib all the time which is riba diyun it is it is the the it is the premium the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity very very simple example you go to bank of america or to chase and you apply for $100,000 personal loan or uh, investment loan or student loan, whatever. You know from day one that this is a loan and you have to pay it back plus certain amount, right? Could be APR, it could be lump sum, it could be flat fee, I mean, whatever the formula they use might be. So we have, we have a, a principal amount and we have surplus or premium on top of the amount. Why it is problematic from a Sharia perspective when, I mean, this is a very good question. You take a loan from the bank, for example, and the bank charges you, let's say, 3% um, or 5% interest. You take that money, you indulge it in a business, you uh, make profit 10, 15%, right? You pay the principal, you pay the interest, and you keep the rest for yourself. If everybody is happy, if it is a win-win situation, then why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still prohibiting riba? It's a very good question. Well. The example that has, uh, I just mentioned is just one example of different examples that do happen in the real life. Sometimes you make, believe it or not, Sheikh Yasser, you make not 100% profit, you make 10,000% profit. It does happen in the real life, and I'm responsible for what I say, mm -hmm. right? It's absolutely unfair to give the bank only 3 or 4 or 5% APR or interest, and you keep the rest of the profit for yourself. It did happen, especially like in, in, in March 2020, just a few days before the pandemic started, you know, hitting the economy in, in the USA, that, that you were unable to make profit for sure because the whole economy actually got frozen. You are unable even to maintain your, your principal, right? You lost the principal, the principal amount, you know, the amount that you took, the loan that you took from the bank has been lost because of the economy. And by the law of the land, the bank still actually can go after you and ask for the principal amount and ask for the interest on top of it. So in, in, in both cases, there is a lot of injustice uh, um, um, happen in the real life. Sometimes real exploitation when the bank is not taking any risk whatsoever. Okay, the bank actually is shifting and just putting the risk on your shoulder. Here is the loan, you do whatever you want. Okay, you make a profit, you, uh, you, uh, you, you, uh, you break even, you uh, incur loss. We do not care about you. Here is $100,000. You bring it back next year, $103,000. After two years, $106,000. This is absolutely un unfair because the bank 
is not taking any liability or responsibility or risk, if you wish, with the other party. And this is, this is why Islam actually is strictly standing against riba because of the injustice actually implemented. In the Islamic finance system, if you go to uh, Islamic Chase Bank or Islamic Bank of America, for example, and you apply for a loan, they would say, well, we do not have money for you. We do not, we do not give you a loan here. You are in the wrong place. If you want to finance for your business, let's sit down and talk business, right? You want to build a house, there is something called murabaha or musharaka or ijara. You want to construct a building, there is something called istisna. Uh, you want some cash money to upgrade your business, there is something called mudaraba. So we sit down together and we discuss business and we go with the model technically called the risk sharing model versus the risk shifting model, right? The, 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 the prevailing economic finance system is going with the, with the, with the shift, with the, with the risk shifting model. You take the money, you are by your own, we do not care about you, okay? The Islamic finance goes with the risk sharing model. We are partners. If there is any profit, everybody enjoys the profit. If there is any loss, actually everybody will be, will be losing. So you see the huge difference between the injustice implemented and happen in the real life when you go with the traditional system versus the justice and the fairness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually is calling for through the prohibition of, of riba. So Sheikh, it is, can we say therefore that even though the general rule is that any transaction the two parties agree to is halal if it is done by mutual consultation, Allah Azza wa Jal has made a specific mutual consultation haram even if they both agree and that is riba. And that is because riba by its nature is exploitative. Can we say something like this? That's absolutely correct. We have a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, conducting business and, and partnership, uh, transaction between people. We have a lot of flexibility. Go ahead and do whatever you want. As long as you are staying away from riba, as long as it is proven that no one is advancing money to somebody else and that principle and its return are guaranteed. Right? This is actually the most fundamental component that we have to take into consideration. As you know, Sheikh, uh, there is gharar that has to be avoided. There is uncertainty that has to be avoided. But the most, like, you know, the most prohibited and the most important matter that we have to pay attention to is to stay away from riba, which is, which is a kind of exploitation. Jayid. And so, Sheikh, can we also then define riba, uh, or at least the type that we are most interested in, is every loan that guarantees some type of benefit upon the lender is a type of riba yeah every every loan brings a stipulated benefit to the to the lender not to the borrower the lender yeah, yeah the lender will be counted as uh, uh, as riba when we say stipulated benefit it is with the understanding that the lender actually is not taking any risk. Yes, Rough. it's a there loan, is, it's not yeah, a business exactly. investment. Exactly, yeah. uh, absolutely, it, it is a loan. Loan means that you are by, by your own. You take the money, do whatever you want, I don't care about you, you come back after one year, you pay me the principal and the, and the interest. And I can go after you by the law of the land because that is the agreement between you and I. That is, that is the, the riba Jayid. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits. So, Sheikh, can you give us some examples of riba-based transactions here in America and however much time you want to spend, everybody always asks about the issue of mortgages. So can you summarize your position about mortgages in this? So طيب. examples of riba and what do you think of the reality of the mortgage situation uh, for sure. us here in America? Once, once we comprehend the definition of riba, the challenge that we are facing here actually is to implement that definition and to figure out whether a certain transaction does involve riba or not, right? This is the challenge that we are facing mm -hmm. here. I'll give you an example. What is the difference between me offering you, Sheikh Yasser, $5,000 loan, right? And, and I ask you that, that you have to pay me the $5,000, $5,500 within one year. That's a straightforward interest-bearing loan. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. What if I have decided to go to Bank of America and I opened a, a saving account and based on the agreement, that $5,000 has to be paid back to me 5,500 within one year. What's the difference between this scenario and the other scenario? Technically speaking, there is no difference. No difference whatsoever. This actually means that opening a saving account is an interest-bearing loan, believe it or not. It's not introduced to you as an interest-bearing loan. 
but that is the nature of the agreement, right? You give your money to Bank of America, your principal is guaranteed. Your return on, 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 on the investment, which is the RIBA, is guaranteed by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's actually the very confusing part, that the vast majority of those transactions that we are getting involved in are not introduced to us as RIBA, as the explicit RIBA that we know. They are like, you know, introduced to you otherwise. And your job as a practicing Muslim is to investigate and to uh, unlock the secret of the agreement and find out. Again, if someone is giving money, and that money, the principal amount, and its return, both are guaranteed, that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Whether it is called riba in the real life, or it is called otherwise, we do not care. And this actually brings to our attention, Sheikh, the, 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 the well-known uh, fiqh maxim, al-qaid al-fiqhiyya, al-ibratu fi al-uqood lil-maqasidi wal-ma'ani la lil-alfadi wal-mabani. What matters in transactions is the essence and reality, not the wording or the formality. So even if the, if, if the charge that you are charging others or you are charged by others is introduced to you as uh, otherwise, right? If it, is, if it is a premium that has to be paid on top of the principle, that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. And based on that, based on that, opening a saving account, the default rule of opening a saving account is that it is not an option because it is a straightforward interest-bearing loan. Give another example from the real life. You have only $500 in your, uh, in your debit card, in your checking account, and you stopped by any point of sale and you made a transaction of $700. Usually it goes through, usually it goes through. Okay, in the bank statement of next month, you will see that you have to pay back $200, and on top of that, there is $35 over a draft charge. It's not RIBA, no, it is over a draft charge. Now, your job is to interpret or to unlock the secret of what happened. When you, when you do a transaction of $700, it means that you have taken $200 from the bank. Am I correct? Is it like a gift for you? As we say in Arabic? No, it is not, right? So you have to pay back the $200. If this is the only thing you need to pay back, then we get to go. I mean, what is the concern? You borrow 200, you pay it back 200. Mm -hmm. Problem here is that you pay on top of it $35. I'm just giving random numbers, right? That number is, is introduced to you as overdraft charge. Well, you borrowed 200 and you paid it back or you have to pay it back $235, you see? Well, that overdraft charge by default, by default, is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Now, you can maybe prove otherwise. I mean, there might be some justification that there is some logistic work and, and paperwork has to be done like to, you know, get that 200, um, that is very possible. But the default rule is that you pay on top of the principle that you have borrowed, that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. So example actually can go on on. You, maybe now you can see the pattern. You know, Sheikh, let me, let me give you the opposite example. How about the cashback? Cash back? Yeah, cash back. From the Discover card or something. Here you go. You have a credit card, right? And you use it for $100. You get $5 cash back. A lot of people actually say, is the cash back uh, riba? Well, before you jump to a conclusion, you need to, again, unlock the secret of what happened. What does it mean for you to use your credit card for purchasing? It means that you are borrowing money from the credit company, am I correct? So you borrow $100, $100, okay, and you benefit from the $5, right? So you borrow 100 and you pay it back how much? 95. 95, no, $95, because, because the cash back is $5. So 100, 100 minus five, that's 95. So you borrow 100 and you pay it back less. Now this is absolutely the opposite of riba. We just said, Every loan that brings a stipulated benefit to the lender. Well, who is benefiting here, the lender or the borrower? The borrower. The borrower. So the cash back actually is halal. And as I always say that if you have any problem with the cash back, give it to me. I mean, I would be inshallah more than happy with this. <laughs> Some people are happy at that. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But Sheikh, we didn't answer the issue of... Sure. 
حاجة and, and ضروره and mortgage. I mean, خلاصة uh, I know this is very detailed, but if you can just summarize your and I'm just position or, or is yeah, it we'll 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 discuss it actually in details tomorrow, inshallah, in our seminar. That's between Dhuhr and Asr from two uh, fifteen to five fifteen, inshallah. We will be having inshallah like enough time to discuss it. But to uh, uh, briefly, briefly, what does it mean to to mortgage a house? Again, you have to unlock the secret of, uh, of the transaction before you jump to a conclusion. When you mortgage a house, you get involved in three different transactions simultaneously. There is a sale agreement where you as a customer okay, buy a house from the landlord. And there is a loan agreement because of course you do not have half a million dollars to pay it cash for the house. So you apply for a loan from the mortgage company. That's a loan agreement, right? And there is a mortgage agreement where the mortgage company actually puts a lien on the property to secure their money. So three different transactions are going simultaneously. Sale actually is halal. Mortgage, according to the definition of the Quran, when kuntum ala safarin wa lam tajidu katiban, farihanum maqbooda. Like it is the right of the, it is absolutely the right of the lender to mortgage the property of the borrower to secure his, his money. So mortgage agreement is fine. Sale agreement is fine. Loan agreement is not fine because I mean you borrow half a million dollars, you pay it back six or seven or, or even eight hundred thousand dollars within thirty years. Some people get confused. They see like the name of Bank of America on, on on the deed of trust, thinking that oh the bank is owning the house. No, wrong answer. The bank actually is the lien holder of the property, not the owner of the property. So the bank is not owning the property. Bank is just putting a lien on the property to secure to secure his fund. So we ended up having three different transactions. Two of them are halal, and one of them is haram. If you want to be like a very American democratic guy, you go with the majority, right? Two against one. So mortgage is halal. Here you go. Well, in the Islamic finance system, it goes the other way around, right? If it is proven that one deal is haram within that package, a combination of three different transactions, then the whole deal actually is ruined. The whole deal actually is not. You know, it's not halal. Based on that, the default rule of mortgaging a house in the United States, according to the traditional way, is not a halal option for Muslims. Now, the Sheikh is asking about Amja position. We do have some, some attempts okay, by different Islamic mortgage companies who try to uh, offer an Islamic alternative. They are not in the same level of seriousness and diligence in applying genuine and sound Islamic mortgage uh, options. If you go to our website, Amja, well, you just, just Google it, Amja, A-M-J-A, -A, uh, uh, Islamic Mortgage Companies, you will see a very long, detailed declaration showing those five different major, I would say, uh, Islamic Mortgage Companies and the status of each one of them. Jay, Sheikhna, um, let me play, not devil's advocate, because we don't do devil's advocate, but let me pay, play, what do you call them? They're not angel's advocate. Either. Let me just play the Mu'taril, the, the person who's coming with the other opinion. As you are aware, Sheikhna, there are a number of academics and even scholars. They are not mainstream, but that's simply because mainstream doesn't accept them as being mainstream. But there are ulama and there are academics who are arguing that riba and the rulings of riba have to be rethought for fiat currency. And that is for multiple reasons. Of them is the inflationary nature of fiat currency. And there are other reasons they bring as well that these academics would say, we all agree the classical Quranic riba is haram, we all agree, but this cash that we're using, this paper currency that we're using, given that it is different from uh, gold and silver and that it is actually dealing from gold and silver, that's one argument. And then the other argument, which I think is very interesting, and that is that the value does not remain stagnant. And a long-term loan does not retain the same monetary value over the course of 20 years. So currency by its nature is inflationary. And so these group of academics, some of them outright say there is no riba and fiat, but others say that traditional fiqh has to be rethought. And we have to have a more nuanced response to the realities of modern finance. So without getting too technical, what is your overall position about uh, this i'tirad, this objection? Right. There is a, a minor one and a major one. The minor one, if, you, if I mean, if we ask those scholars and academics, yes, I mean, fiat money does not have any intrinsic value, and gold and silver do have. How can you buy gold and silver nowadays? 
Bitcoin. You have to use Bitcoin. <laughs> you, you have to use fiat <laughs> money, right? So fiat money actually is used to purchase gold and silver. It takes the same rules of, of, of gold and silver. So all the like RIBA rules apply to gold and silver. They do apply to fiat currency nowadays. This is actually the minor issue. The major issue, Sheikh Yasser, it is, it is really a fundamental one. What we believe in is that loan is not a mode of finance to start with. So the inflation issue does not even exist according to our theory, okay? If someone actually is approaching me asking for $5,000 to pay for the tuition fees or the rent of his apartment or to, uh, you know, whatever surgery or, uh, I mean, something that's really, you know, necessary, I'll be more than happy to give him $5,000 for maybe a few weeks, few months. And a part of that actually is that I'm willing to take, you know, to take the inflation or to incur the inflation because giving, giving a loan is, a, is an act of devotion and charity. I give it, you know, for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm not allowed to take any single, you know, penny on top of the principal. I give him or her $5,000, I get it back 5,000, no more or no less, right? Now, if that person actually is approaching me asking for $100,000, and I know for a fact that he wants to upgrade his business, right? Okay. Well, even if I have the, the you know, the $100,000, I will not give it to him. I mean, based or not, with all due respect, I give you $100,000 as a Qardun Hassan, interest-free loan. You take my money, right, as a loan, okay, because I do not charge interest and you are practicing Muslim like me, you do not, you know, pay interest. You take my money, you invest it in your business for two, three days, you make tens of thousands of dollars of profit, and then you come back to me after three years giving me a big hug, Jazakallah khair, and here is your money back. Seriously? Is this a, a good business? Of course it is not. So if I want that you want my money to do business, well, let's sit down and talk and talk business. We can go with the mudarabon, right? I give you the money because I know that you are the expert in the car dealership business. Here is the money. Here is the shurut and the conditions and the stipulations. Go ahead and work on my money on my behalf. Whatever profit you make into profit, I will take. So my point here, Sheikh, is that Inflation is an issue when it comes to giving the loan as a mode of finance. Well, if we disagree on, the, on this fundamental issue, that loan is not even a mode of finance to start with, then the, then the inflation issue does not exist to start with. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, Sheikh, I, all I'm saying, theoretically you are correct, but realistically, people will be taking loans for various reasons, even let's say medical school, for example, or something of this nature where the loans do become quite large and um, there, there is a haja amongst the people. But you are correct from an ideal perspective, we should not be taking large amounts of loans for business purposes or even for... In, uh, business you go purposes. with any of those like Islamic modes, of, it depends mm -hmm. on the nature of the business that you want to finance for. But loan, I mean, to start with is not a mode of finance, period. No. Inshallah, khair. So move on to the second to last question. Um, we talked about riba and back and forth. Let's get to the broader question. Can you define what makes Islamic finance Islamic? What is Islamic about our version of Islamic finance? I'll be honest here. A lot of people think that it's a type of numbers game or word game. The, and you yourself just said, the ruling is, we don't care about the words used, we care about the maqasid, we care about the overall. And it is as if some of these Islamic mortgage companies, they're taking from Fannie and Freddie, they're taking from the same people, and they're even charging a little bit more. And in reality, it seems as if the contract is constructed all in their favor. So what exactly makes Islamic finance Islamic? Well, in the same way that we have like a Muslim family law and Muslim penal law and Muslim economic, you know, uh, system, we do have an Islamic finance system. If you avoid like certain defects in the, in the agreement in which one of them or the most important one actually is riba, then this is by default an Islamic one. And by the way, I do not think it is fair enough to call it Islamic to start with. You can call it a Jewish finance, believe it or not. You can call it a Christian finance. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who prohibited us from dealing with interest, is the same one who prohibited the Jewish community from dealing with interest. وَأَخْذِهِمُ الرِّبَى وَقَدْ نُهُ عَنْهُ وَقَدْ نُهُ عَنْهُ So riba actually is prohibited in Christianity for fact. Riba is prohibited in, in the Abrahamic faith for fact, in the Judaism for fact. 
So I do not mind at all if you call it a Jewish finance or Christian finance, I do not mind at all. The most important thing is to make sure that you go with the just and fair and ethically responsible, responsible uh, finance. Now back to the maybe mortgage, Islamic mortgage companies. Yeah, is so this the, yeah, what makes it Islamic or what makes it different? Well, if you are looking for a genuine, sound, 100% Islamic finance practice in the USA with those companies who deal in the secondary market, we are wasting our time, to be honest with you. You won't find it. I mean, you cannot find yeah. it, period, right? Unless you operate offline. And alhamdulillah, we do have a lot of attempts here in the, in, in the US, Islamic mortgage companies who do not, who do not deal in the secondary market. For those who do not know what, what does mean secondary market, banks usually, mortgage companies, do not have the financial ability of waiting for you as a customer for 20, 30 years to pay them back the principal. They just turn around next day and they sell that contract to Freddie Mac and Freddie Mae. If it, uh, if it is worth, let's say, $1 million, they take nine, $970,000 you know, uh, cash, and that's it, and you start paying your money to Freddie Mac and Freddie Mae. Again, they, they do not have the ability. In order for them to make those contracts, okay, sellable to Freddie Mac and Freddie Mae, they have to go with the book. So they all actually are Freddie Mac compliant way more than to be Sharia compliant. Now, to be honest and fair enough with those companies, they are not in the same level of diligence and, and dedication to implement uh, uh, an Islamic uh, finance, finance model. Problem here, Sheikh, is that Problem, the fundamental problem is that the whole system is a non-Islamic one. So in order for you to incorporate a genuine and sound Islamic finance practice within a non-Islamic finance, it is close to impossible, right? Because of the severe incompatibility mm -hmm. between the uh, two, two differences. In the, in, in the Islamic one, you have to own the property. You have to be liable and responsible for the property. You pay maintenance, you pay tax, you pay insurance. Okay, you take the risk of uh, like any increase or decrease in the market value and the traditional finance system you cannot do any of the above so to do all the above and not to do all the above i mean it is it is impossible however however we do have some serious attempts who were able to navigate through the system and find a way that is i call it halal enough option halal enough halal enough <laughs> option it's <laughs> a new fifth category <laughs> yeah halal enough uh, option Versus just just uh, like traditional mortgage. One. Well, I mean, if you have halal enough versus absolutely haram, which one you go with? Like back home, we say Ramadan al amal right? Like you know, something is better than nothing. So we do have, alhamdulillah, some some attempts. Again, if you go to uh, Amja, just Google Amja, Islamic mortgage company, you read like a very detailed declaration about those five major companies who operate in the U.S. Jay, Sheikhna, it's uh, Friday night, so I'm going to conclude with one question, inshallah. It's it's a bit of a blunt question, Sheikh, but I mean, I, you are the person to ask this too. Isn't it a little bit overwhelming then? Like, what can we do against the global financial market then? I mean, is there any hope for us Muslims impacting the system? The whole world functions on riba. The whole world is based on a version of capitalism that from its very usul and fundamentals contradicts our ethos and our spirit. Yani for us, Giving alone is an act of worship. Right then and there, we change the entire paradigm of you know the Western version of, of capitalism. For us, you know, it's a business partnership. So, what can we do to affect the system? I mean, we're a small minority in this country, and even in the globe, no doubt, you know, Muslims are much larger, but still, the system is totally antithetical to us. So, can we as Muslims? really produce a version or a product that is so solid, it will inshallah ta'ala supplant and replace the other system or maybe even make a dent in it. Well, are you talking about Muslim, Muslim, Muslim countries, authorities who do have the ability of restructuring the finance system? We're talking about Muslim minority in the US. Let's focus about, Jayid, okay. like focus on, on, on ourselves here. Well, okay. I have been in this field for, for 20 years, uh, Sheikh Yasser. I wholeheartedly believe that, that the Muslim community in the United States does have enough financial resources, intellectual, academic, human resources that are enough to establish our own finance system in the United States. Wallahi. Do you know that, that, that it is very, very possible to establish a federal credit union 
federal credit union. You need maybe two or three million dollars to establish it, to register it, you know, accordingly and to start operating. In the same way that we have a lot of challenges, we have a lot of opportunities here. What we are lacking, unfortunately, I wish, Wallahi, I'm wrong, but this is, this is the reality. We are lacking a vision, lacking a leadership. We can establish our own, our own system. And I'm aware of several different attempts. For example, Islamic mortgage companies who operate of the system. They do not deal with Freddie Mac and Freddie Mac whatsoever. Very successful. Yes, their financial capacity is very limited, but at the end of the day, they produce. Why, I mean, why do not just copy and paste this, this uh, model and do it over and over? How about establishing, establishing a federal credit union, which is the alternative actually of the traditional banking system? I'm aware of several LLC, like different, different corporations who just bring money from different investors and they work on the, on the ground doing real estate business or car dealership or whatever halal business and they are doing a wonderful job. We can, we can challenge the system. We can, on the other hand, we can, we can penetrate the system if we do the necessary lobbying, talking to like, you know, uh, public officials, do, like doing our own, we can change the system a little bit and just establish some Sharia compliant, you know, uh, 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 Islamic finance institutes in the, in the United States. So Alhamdulillah, I mean, when there is a will, there is a, there is a way. Uh, the problem here, Sheikh, is with the will, with the vision, with the, with the leadership. I tried myself, and it's not a secret, to establish a, a federal credit union. And subhanAllah, I was, I was like pushed back by, by several, not, not like, you know, common Muslim, no, by several scholars. Oh, be careful, Sheikh. I mean, this is money. I mean, you, you do not want to get involved in, stay away from just educate people. Do not. I want to to, like, like bring Islamic finance from the theory to the practice. Instead of like acting as the bad guy, this is haram and this is riba, I want to provide an alternative. When I started working on the ground, there was like a lot of, you know, pushback from within the Muslim community, leaders, mashayikh, and, and ulama. That's the, the, the genesis of the problem that we have, Sheikh Yas. Otherwise, wallahi, the opportunities are, are, are there. I'm, I'm responsible for what I say. We can do a lot. No. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And inshallah ta'ala, maybe within, within our generation, inshallah, we'll be, we'll be able to see a viable alternative where our youth, maybe even be this people in the audience, inshallah, when they grow up and it's time for them to not just get cash back, but house back, <laughs> inshallah, as well, uh, that there will be viable alternatives, inshallah ta'ala. That's good news, alhamdulillah. Shaykhana, it's, uh, I know you've had a flight and a long day today. Zakallah khair for uh, honoring us with your presence.